welcome everyone to Lunchalytics 53. Um, and this is the always the most popular one, the hockey analytics. And we have two fantastic guest speakers. We have Sean Solbach, uh, who's going to talk about uh, quality of competition and incorporating that into a web dashboard slash, I don't even know what you'd call it, stat site. And then we have Michael Parcati. He's going to talk to us about using the power of machine learning to find the most machine-like goalie uh, who has the best uh, potential to be awesome. So um, we need to do a shout out to our sponsors. We have Dark Horse Analytics, kind of a perennial sponsor. Uh, who I work for. We have ATB, we have Blue Cross, and Startup Edmonton. And I just have to move and see that Nate Computer Training Center is also a sponsor for us this year. Um, but we're coming to the end of the season and starting uh, next month will be the last one. Uh, we don't have a confirmed topic. It looks like it's going to be vulnerable populations. Uh, and then we have one more uh, we're planning in June. And our tentative plan for that one is visualizations for public policy or analytics for public policy. Uh, we'll probably talk about some of the COVID uh, uses of visualization for that, it looks like. But nothing confirmed on those yet. We are still looking for additional sponsors. So if you happen to have bunch of money burning a hole in your pocket and you'd like to support Lunchalytics, especially once we start up again and start uh, feeding people lunches, um, please let us know. And uh, we'd love to promote you to the world. Um, who knows, uh, as this expands, we already have 61 people here, which is a pretty full room in general. Um, and right now, everyone is going to be fully uh, muted is just the way these, uh, this one is set up. Um, and the questions, if you have them, you could put them in the Q and A, uh, or on the chat and, um, we'll try and get to them, uh, at the end of each speaker's talk. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Sean and he's going to talk to us about hockey analytics and quality of competition. Take it away, Sean. All right, thanks, Dan. I'm just going to share my screen and get set up. Give me two secs. Um, here we go. Dan, you can see my presentation fine? Yep, I can see you great. Cool. All right, thanks, everyone, for coming. It's cool to see everyone show up when there's no free lunch involved. So that's good. Um, my name is Sean Solbach. I, I work with the Puck IQ guys. I'm probably the less, or less famous of the Puck IQ guys but I do work with Darcy and Ganesh. Um, building the data sets in the front end and helping data viz and working on those things. And the presentation I'm gonna to cover today uh, focuses on the Oilers since we're an Edmonton meetup. Uh, assume many of you are hockey fans if you're tuning in today. So should be highly relevant and we'll just get going. Um, before I do, I just wanna tell you a bit about myself. I'm currently the uh, CTO at SAM. SAM is an Edmonton based startup here in town. Uh, we provide critical incidents to customers so they can respond quicker. Um, nothing like working at a critical incidents startup during the world's biggest you know, pandemic. Uh, it's been a busy time for us. My role is to oversee the data science, social intelligence and developers. So I work mostly in the strategy and the measuring and the, the roadmap uh, with the team. Um, I'm over two on the switching the screen there we go uh also a hockey fan and hobbyist i've been kind of a hockey fan forever but about the last 10 years or so into hockey analytics um so my interest in hockey analytics sort of started through reading the low tide blog i've been reading it probably every day since 2006 um so he's he's an absolute legend for me the discussion that goes in there has really kind of you know propelled me into this some of my free time and um uh, it's been a great part, uh, part to be of that. Um, another thing I've built is a, a hockey website called frozenpools.ca, which was a fantasy pools website. 
through that, I ended up working with Gabe Desjardins on Behind the Net. He supplied my data and I swapped uh, programming services for him. So, so we had a working relationship. Um, through that, I sort of met Rob Bullman and organized the first Alberta Hockey Analytics Conference in 2013. And then, you know, continued to just kind of poke around, play as, as, you know, my, as my time allowed me and joined the Puck IQ guys in 2018. So Puck IQ, um, I assume so many of you know what it is or, or, or the people involved, but it's created by Ganesh, who's Oilers Nerd Alert on Twitter, and Darcy, who's Wood Guy. And basically um, what it is is the, the assumption that who you play matters. Um, Darcy did a really good job talking about, you know, the existing quality competition numbers and how they, they in aggregate, they actually weren't providing a lot of value when it, when it came down to, to hockey analytics sometime around 2014, 15. And some of the discussion that you may have, have read or saw if you, you check in on low tide or Twitter or whatever, is that fundamentally there's just kind of like, just didn't jive. Like it, it's more of a numbers problem, but because, if you're playing, say, Sidney Crosby, that, that does matter, and that should affect your numbers. So how, it's, it was more of a question of, can we do better? And that's, that was what Puck IQ was seeking to address. Um, another post I would encourage reading is uh, some of G's work around the effect. Um, if you'll notice on Puck IQ, and I'll get there closely, the interest fund like, is the default statistic that we show for, for all charts and all, all team pages and player pages. Um, so basically what it is, is it's, uh, so when, when you talk hockey analytics, you generally talk, you know, Corsi, which is a chance, scoring chance, or Fenwick, which is a block shot or a scoring chance. Um, so dangerous Fenwick is kind of a, an expected goals calculation that takes into effect, you know, is it a slap shot or is it a backhand or how far is it from the net? And G in, in these posts was able to, to prove that it correlates very well to uh, expected goals for by evolving wild. And so, so just in that sense, if that's the golden standard of the publicly available solutions out there that, that we believe is a very valuable metric that we can show in Puck IQ. Um, within Puck IQ, uh, just a couple notes, it's five on five data only. So we're not looking at special teams or goaltending. I believe Michael has a presentation coming up on goaltending, uh, which will be very interesting as well. So, you know, it's a part of the game. It, it's not a complete picture. Um, and it's also a tool, right? There's, there's outliers, you know, Connor McDavid's going to outscore, you know, his scoring chances, you know, like, you know, maybe like, you know, there's outliers, there's edge cases, there's people that don't have finishing ability. So finishing ability matters, but all in all, it does help you and does, does provide information and, um, and, and it does help. So, so the approach of Puck IQ, which I kind of started covering a little bit on the last slide, is, is basically, it's two things. It's to determine who you play against because we assume that that matters. And then we, what we did is we, we tiered them into elite, middle, and gratensity, basically saying if you're playing against Sidney Crosby a good chunk of the time versus you're playing against, say, I'll say Gaten Haas or something like that on the Oilers, there's a different expectation and, and those results sh should differ. So we keep track of how you do with each bin. And since I joined Puck IQ, I've been mostly involved, less so on the generation of the data. That's G's, G's wheelhouse, but kind of on the data viz and then, then the display of it. So my history working with Rob and the old quality competition is that the sledgehammer graphs provided a, a, a quick overview of, you know, how a team's doing, how a player's doing, how a player does from season to season. So that whole idea of top right being good, bottom left being bad um, is, is what I've helped a lot with over the last few years. And here we go. We'll get into it with the Edmonton Oilers. Um, so we all know we're, we're from Edmonton. Hockey, hockey's king around here. That, you know, the Oilers had, were having a pretty good season before COVID shut us down. Um, and there was a couple of reasons for that. Um, obviously, a big reason was McDavid and Dreisaitl. All, all the discussion kind of, you know, around the Oilers involves those two, at least at some point. And um, they, they drive a lot you know, a lot of interest, you know, and matchups from fans. So I'm just going to quickly show you what like McDavid's and uh, Dry Saddle's player pages look like. Um, here we go. Sorry, I got to go here. So here is Connor McDavid's player page on Puck IQ. Um, so you'll see on the left side of it here, uh, you see time on ice elite versus time on ice grit. So that's kind of our, our, our proxy for, for competition. So the more time you play against elite, the, the higher up you are on the graph, um, 
so on the y-axis there, likewise, if you're being sheltered, you'll be lower on the graph. Um, you'll see here, and I said we default to DFF, and then of course we didn't, but um, DFF is our, is our default here, so you can see how Connor has done over the last three years, uh, or four years. Um, you can see in 2016, 2017, and 15, 16, he was lights out the last two years. Um, he, he's faded off in terms of just pure scoring chances. Um, you know, there's theories for potentially why part of it has to do with the fact that the coaches are actually playing them, you know, 24 to 26 minutes a game and they're playing hard minutes. So it, so it is a, is a really tough battle and they're playing all the special teams as well. So that's, you know, a theory in general, if he had better line mates, again, he'd probably be in the 15 or the 16, 17 range as well. But, um, here's Connor's page. Here's Leon's page. Um, you can see. 14, 15, he played that half year and he went to uh, Kamloops, I believe, back to juniors. So the other years are a bit more relevant. 15, 16, 17, 18, he's, he's been, you know, consistently playing harder minutes. You know, coaches are lining up their better players against him because he's one of the better players offensively in the league. And, and here he is um, of note. And Connor has this as well, as they both will have higher GF per goal, goal score percentage versus um, like general scoring chances. So that just means these guys have, you know, lead finishing ability. They'll, they'll always out chance their, their scoring chances compared to the average, um, which is, you know, a good thing to have on your team. Um, hopping back in, uh, the Oilers, so Puck IQ's five on five data. The Oilers were actually an only like a, a, a pretty average to below average five on five team. So part of this analysis with Puck IQ that we can do is to dive into it, but I'm going to quickly highlight um, their special teams and goal and goaltending um, just at a high level. If you look at their special teams, this here is a quick chart I made showing the Oilers. They had 29.5% power play and 84% um, on the, the penalty kill. Those were both highest in the league, and I believe the power play percentage was the second best in the last 10 years. So over here, I have a, a, a PPDO column that I call it. It's a power play PDO. It's, you know, I just used a PDO because it's average to 100. They're 113. They, they, they're 28 goals better than average on, on those special teams, which is pretty crazy when you look at the rest of the numbers. No one else was, is, was that good or that bad, except for Anaheim, Detroit, and Ottawa over on the, the negative side. But yeah, so, so the real reason the Oilers were good and, you know, it, which would offset some of their five on five deficiencies was because of their special teams ability. If you look at their goaltending real quick, um, here's Koskinen in terms of save percentage, all states. And here's Mike Smith. Overall, they were, I believe, about 12th or 13th in the league. So if you have Connor, Mc, Connor and uh, Leon scoring at the clips that they're scoring at, you can get league average goaltending. You know, there you go. You can have a playoff team, and that's where the Oilers were. Just to really quickly show, uh, where the Oilers ranked on five on five goal differential. And this is kind of the point I was making earlier is that they are 25th in the league. They're minus 16 goals. So they're, they're generally bleeding chances, bleeding, bleeding goals on five on five. But overall, because of the special teams, um, they were in, in a playoff position. So they say so they're doing pretty good. Um, I do want to make the point that through all this and anything that I say, if I sound negative about Connor McDavid or Leon Dreisaitl, that I don't consider them to be at all the problem. Um, Connor was around, you know, 50% five on five. So um, uh, in terms of scoring chances, I, I think that's okay. I think it'd be more about getting them better players to help them and, 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 and anything like that. If I sound negative there, I, I, I don't want to intend that. So I just want to make that clear before I go on. Um, so be, I thought it'd be a good exercise to look at the forwards and how they do as a team on five on five and I'm just going to switch over to here this is the Oilers five on five you can see uh, in the top middle you see Connor and Leon I believe Cassian's in that cluster as well as so is Kyler Yamamoto um, on, they were the guys playing hard minutes and coming out even um, when your team is generally getting out a chance that's a that's a pretty good place to be Sam Gagne was a bit sheltered but did quite well you can see here, looking at the different bins that he played against, um, he was quite good against the middle and the grit density bins and then sort of struggled uh, on the elites uh, playing against the harder matchups, which 
you know, is, is no slight against him. It did seem that he was able on the lower lines, he was really able to contribute. And it's kind of too bad they, they traded him away there at the end of the season. Um, Chase on Patrick Ross and Gaten Haas are getting sort of easier minutes um, and, and doing all right. They, they seem to do all right. Gaten Haas is an interesting player. I know he's one of Low Tide's more favorite guys. He does quite well against elites. You can see right there he outperforms um, against elites. He's, he's above half. He struggled on Gretensity, which is an interesting thing. That's usually not the case. So I don't know if it's a, a case of when he was playing on the other, the, the third and fourth lines, if he was getting pulled down a bit by other guys. But um, he, he's an interesting guy to look into. He might be worth a Wowie analysis, which is something you can do on um, Puck IQ as well. You can compare, you know, how to Gaten Haas do with Connor McDavid, or how did he do with uh, Leon Dreisaitl versus how did he do with and without, say, Jujar Kara. But you can see on the bottom left here, this was kind of the five-on-five sort of issues on the third line there. In my opinion, Jujar Kara, Josh Archibald, and Riley Sheehan, they're getting generally sheltered and generally quite outchanced. Um, they were taking a lot of the D-zone draws and, and, and things like that, but generally those, that's the biggest area of concern. Um, one thing you can do in these graphs as well is you can look at how they did versus the elites alone. Again, this going to be sh the graphs going to be shifted left, and you can see. And then there's Gaidon Haas again. There he's he doesn't spend a lot of time, but he he did in terms of pure scoring chances. He did all right. Kyler Yamamoto came on, you know, later in the season when the team was performing it that did better and was playing very hard minutes. And, and he really, really helped the team, um, which sort of gets me to my next point. Um, Kyler Yamamoto joined the season, our team around uh, New Year's. And at the same time, uh, Tippett decided to split up Leon Dreisaitl and Connor McDavid um, onto different lines. And I thought it'd be an interesting exercise to see. The team seemed to be noticeably better um, I, when they made that change to, tactically. So it'd be good to see the splits, and that's one thing you can do in Puck IQ. So looking at the next tab here, and I have to be careful, don't click that stop share button. Um, you can see this is the, the October 1st to uh, January 1st splits. You can see Cassian here. You can see at the very beginning of the season, our third and fourth lines were actually, you know, quite dry offensively. And um, they, they were they were struggling a bit, but um, Overall, the team was, you know, still hovering around the middle. And, you know, it's interesting to see if we compare it on the next page, our tab I have here, is that when they added Kyler and they added, uh, um, split up the lines, you can see, you know, everybody shifted to the top right a bit in, in, the, in the top six. Kyler's here, Leon's here, Nugent Hopkins is here, Cassian here. Only guy that didn't quite make it to even was Connor, who didn't get any of the help, um, all the kind of reinforcements went to that second line, which was quite strong. And if you look at the goals for, if you give it one second, that line was absolute killer in terms of goals for. So they, they were really buzzing. Leon, Nuge, and uh, Kyler were, were playing very well. So that matches the kind of eye test that you, you would have seen as a fan is that they did seem to improve. Um, another thing is the, uh, the, the Riley Sheehan, Jujar Kara, Josh Archibalds, they, they crept closer to 45, so they improved as well, which was a little bit offset by Chase on and Haas kind of falling off a bit. But um, kind of very interesting to see. It's, it's good when your, your eyes can, can match the data and you can see these assumptions. And then you, what you can do, I believe, is that you can trust the data a lot when, when, you do, when your eyes don't match and you can give you some, some pause to think of like, why do I think this when the data doesn't match? And you can look at that and you can help make decisions and see is, is this an outlier or what. I'm trying to switch tabs here, but it's, uh, there we go. Um, I thought it'd be interesting to quickly go over some of the other better teams in the league so, so you can compare to the others to see some of the co common patterns that other teams have that are well. So, I mean, it's, it's something that the Oilers can, can be building towards. This here's the Oilers overlaid with the Boston Bruins. Um, you can see in the top right here, Marshawn, Bergeron, and Pasternak. They are right there in the top right. They are playing a lot of minutes. They're playing hard and they're, they're outplaying everyone. So that's, that's really good. What that really enabled Boston to do is it lets them shelter Krejci, Jake 
DeBrusque, they have pretty good depth players that are able to outchance a lot uh, given softer minutes. So um, a couple, one lesson there would just possibly be that they are loading up. Uh, they are giving Bergeron the best help he can get. So Connor McDavid doesn't really have that. Um, so that's a good sign that, you know, if you can bring in a, a, a top, you know, winger to help complement him, that, that can get Connor back to his, you know, 16, 17 levels. And that might let Leon, Kyler Yamamoto, and Nuge just tear up the, uh, the lower competition like they were doing later in the year. I'll quickly show Tampa because they are sort of the opposite of Boston, where they actually use, and if you give it a second, they use Sorelli and Palat to take on the hard minutes and they excel as well. But what that allows um, Tampa to do is they can deploy uh, Kucherov and points against weaker caliber opponents. And again, they are a very good team, strong five on five. So you can see probably the area that the Oilers just need to do. And that part of that can be just, a, you know, a winger for McDavid is just to get a, a few more players in the top right corner that that really just ripples down through the team. And if these guys are playing hard minutes and coming out ahead, then it really helps the rest of the team at five on five. Um, uh, you know, out chance and outscore their opponents. So that's all I have to say about the forwards. And I wonder how much time I have. I didn't set my timer. Um, this is the defense here. Um, you can see there's not a ton of, and I'll just switch over again to Puck IQ so I can show you some things. Um, this is the team overall here. They're just kind of straight line, just close to 50. Just a team that's just slightly getting out chance. They're five on five. There's no real clear stars. I can show you the goals for which is sort of interesting. You can see that Caleb Jones and Matt Benning did quite well in terms of goals um, with their easier minutes. Um, again, I'll do the competition breakdown versus elite. You can see here who was playing against the elite, who was struggling. Um, Chris Russell, you know, he was getting probably had the hardest matchups in terms of, or did, uh, struggled the most in terms of when he was playing against the elites. Uh, but overall, you know, the, the defense was okay. It was just a, more of a reflection of the fact that generally on five on five, they were getting out chance. And I, I believe that if they can help up front, that'll ripple towards the defense. Um, again, I'm going to look at the splits before and after um, just to kind of see as a similar exercise, was the team better? How the defense do in terms of different splits? Um, one thing that's interesting with the D is that uh, Adam Larson had a pretty su significant injury um, in the first half of the year and the, the minutes that he played, he was generally recovering from that surgery. So his numbers a little bit took a bit of a hit. Um, but this is the first half of the year. You can see Ethan Bear. He came out guns a blazing. He was, you know, at least in Edmonton, he was among the, the rookie of the year candidates about how well he was playing. He was moving the puck. He's a real difference maker for the team. And then again, you kind of just see the rest of the team. He was playing with Nurse. Him and him and uh, Nurse were playing the hard minutes, and Clefbaum was actually playing the slightly easier minutes. I believe he was playing quite a bit with Joel Pearson and a bit with Adam Larson before he was hurt. After Christmas, let's see what happened here. Um, the, the only real observation that I have is that Ethan Bear, um, probably due to fatigue, NHL is a hard league. He was, you know, his first three months in the league, excited, and you know, maybe he had an injury or something, but he did definitely fade off in terms of he went from the, the top right and he, then you can see Tippett actually started using cleft bomb more against the harder minutes. So those that maybe want to, you know, go long on a contract with Bear may want more than another three months of, of evidence before they lock him up long-term potentially. Um, I'm, I don't have the answer of why he faded other than, you know, the NHL is a hard league and he's a rookie and maybe that can be expected. But um, that's, all I have for defensemen, um, for, for observations, I'm going to move on here. Um, just in the efforts of time, I'm going to talk about something new that we launched last night on Puck IQ. And uh, basically, it's a, it's, we call it shifts, but I'll elaborate right now as to what it is and, and how it can be valuable. Um, basically, coaches have three main variables with the player who they play against, you know, competition matters. That's the wood money data, um, who they play with. If I'm playing with Connor McDavid, how am I doing without Connor McDavid? If I'm playing with Connor McDavid, my expectations should be higher. Um, kind of those, that sort of 
this type of decision making. And then the, the third point that we never really addressed at Puck IQ was where are they being deployed and, and when do they play against the, the, the other opponents? Um, so that comes down to are you getting ozone shifts, D zone shifts? So we believe it helps with paint a, a more complete picture of, of a player five on five is to include the shift analysis. Oh, there we go, wrong button again. Um, so again, our approach with the shift data is to say, um, to acknowledge that you know, there is like D zone, ozone shift ratios and they do have some value. Um, basically, we have four different shift types that we're tracking, ozone, D zone, neutral zone, and then on the fly. Um, we think that the D zone ozone ratios overstate um, the impact of a D zone ozone because the on the fly shifts account for all the other shifts combined. So we think it's just it's just a slice of of the overall time on ice that you're playing. But our approach is to say how many shifts did you have of each type, and then again how did you how did you do for each one. So when we're sort of binning, we're binning into the different shift types rather than in the competition levels. Um, a question that I've been asked a few times is how come you don't bin by, you know, uh, elite versus middle and, and as well with the, each shift type. And that's something that we haven't done yet. Uh, we could do it yet. We're scared of the, the sample sizes being a little bit too small. And so we're leaving it uh, for down the road. We want to understand this data, the shift data by itself and aggregate before we, uh, you know, slice it one step further. Now you're, you're just really leaving yourself open to smaller sample sizes. I'm going to show you a couple examples of how it can be useful. Um, one second here. I'm going to show um, the Edmonton Oilers, their centers, and how they do different shifts. So this is, again, sorry, this is their wood money for just the centers, just to say, you know, Connor Leon up here, and then here's the other um, forwards. If you look at the shift data, and I'll start with offensive, you can see the difference between, uh, you know, right, like an offensive zone shift, the number shift or the average is around 60%. So everyone is doing, you know, quite a bit better. You know, you get, you get, a, you get deployed in the offensive zone, you're expected to outchance your opponent. Um, what's, what's interesting is Connor McDavid right there is actually has the lowest um, DFF in terms of, um, offensive zone shift starts, which is interesting because he's such an offensive talent. Maybe it's a little bit less space, but if you look at our uh, penalty kill, our power play numbers, he's a big part of that. And, you know, his, his offensive ability is, you know, elite. So I, I don't think we'd want to read too much into that. It's just an interesting observation that of all the guys getting uh, offensive zone starts, he, he's the one that gets less of the chances. If you compare it to the D zone, give it one second. You can see here Riley Sheehan takes most of the D zone shifts, but he also gives up most of the chances. So he's, you know, there's, there's a little bit of room for improvement there. Um, another observation again is that Connor McDavid is near the, the top of um, uh, the chances when he's getting a defensive zone shift. And we already know that he's playing against the elite minute. So the fact that he's there is interesting. Um, we know Connor gets most of his chances through Offensive zone or through the, the, the through the neutral zone because of his speed. So maybe he's such a threat that the defense is scared that he's such a such a weapon. I think that would probably be a waste uh, to Connor to to deploy him defensively. But it's just an interesting observation. I'm going to quickly show Boston. I know I'm running out of time here, but Zdeno Chara is kind of like the, the key guy that in this analysis he gets so many hard minutes and so many defensive zone chances. So this is really quickly. Um, Boston's wood money data versus competition. You can see Char here is just below 50, but he's getting the really hard minutes. If you look at the shift data here, you can see Zidane Char gets 2% of his shifts in the offensive zone versus Tory Krug, who gets quite a bit more. Tory Krug always has beautiful chance data because he's getting you know a slightly easier minutes and a more offensive zone. And to quickly show the defensive zone here, um, you can see. Here we, here's Chara. He's getting the most on the team by far on the defensive zone, and he's coming out, you know, the best in terms of except for whoever this is, Stephen Camper, who probably played one or two games. But yeah, so that's like proof that you know Chara playing elite minutes versus another guy playing elite minutes. His his minutes quite aren't quite the same. So so that's really what we're looking at shifts. We've just launched the data. I know Darcy and Ganesh are looking into it a lot in terms of you know what conclusions can we make. 
we have some early takeaways, and I'm just going to kind of leave it right there. Um, again, ozone's expected to be you know, more favorable than D zone. Um, what's interesting is in, in aggregate over the last three seasons, on the fly is actually an advantage, where, whereas neutral zone is like an average 48.5% Corsi. So something to do with the blue line, something to do with deployment and usage um, is making a neutral zone uh, face off an actual a disadvantage to a player. So we're not sure why we're in the process of digging through all this data, but um, that's where we're at. It's been launched on Puck IQ as of yesterday, and I better quit because I believe I'm out of time. Thanks, John. That was fantastic. Uh, we have a few questions. Uh, what dev tools do you like to use or recommend, Tableau, R, or others? Um, I can talk to, or for my, for my standpoint, I'm a Python guy. Um, all, all the data science that my company uses, and I know G uses it as Python. I know there's R guys that, are, that, that use it as well. Um, the front end of Puck IQ is written in Node.js, and we use a Mongo backend. So that's just, there you go. Okay. Uh, when is this next Alberta Hockey Analytics Conference? Interesting. I'm probably not the guy to talk about that any, or to answer that question anymore. Um, I haven't heard of one for a while. I, I, think, I think I would check with Twitter. Uh, the, I organized the first one. There was a couple more in Calgary. Um, they weren't virtual at the time. They might be virtual going forward. I don't have that answer. All right. Well, maybe if enough people want, uh, we might just have to create one. Uh, last question. Um, how do you collect all this data? Are you scraping it from the web or do you have another source? Yeah, I believe it's all scraped from NHL.com and other sources. Um, but what G does, and especially with the shift data, is he, he actually goes and figures out, based on the events, who was on the ice for certain, for certain times to extrapolate the shift information. So there's a lot of that goes on after the fact to, to, to get the data that you want from the events. But yeah, it's coming from the NHL's event data. All right, uh, I'm just seeing the time we have for questions here. We'll just give uh, two more quick questions. Um, Sean, at what point can we say McDavid is underperforming? Did he really have that much better wingers a couple of years ago? A couple of years ago, excuse me. <laughs> that sounds like someone's trolling me based on what I said in the, uh, the presentation, <laughs> but. Um, honestly, no, like, I mean, he's out getting hundred points. He's leading the league in scoring. He's part of an elite, elite power play. Um, I think when they decided to put the better wingers on dry sidles line, that was because they acknowledged that Connor could probably do it himself. So he's getting the hardest matchups and with less, with less help and he's both boat breaking even, I, I wouldn't say he's part of the problem at all. Um, last question. How did you classify the players in the three pools, elite, average, and gritty? Um, I can show you real quick. This link here, who you play matters. Darcy dives into it a lot. I could, he could probably take 20 minutes to answer that question. But essentially, they use metrics that they believe to be valuable to when doing it. They use time on ice. How much time a coach gives a player generally is a sign that you're a better player. They use points per 60 um, as another key metric. And I'm not sure what else, but they, that was kind of the two metrics that let, let them dot, divvy it up. It's harder for rookies and guys like Elias Pedersen who, you know, come into the league and perform at a high level immediately. But um, that's the general approach. Okay. Well, thanks so much. We will transition now to Mr. Parkati. I'm sure if you, uh, if you want uh, more questions for Sean, he's uh, happy to find you on Twitter. What's your Twitter, hand, Twitter handle, Sean? Uh, I have two. The one I use for hockey is at Frozen Pools, which is from my old site. I'm um, also S Solback, which is more just, you know, what I do to promote my other company. But uh, either or, I, you can reach out to me. Happy to, to chat. Excellent. Um, as someone was asking just about uh, what does it cost to sponsor and what does that look like? Um, we, we have different levels of sponsorship. And you can email me, Dan, at darkhorseanalytics.com. And I can give you some more details, but it's anywhere from sponsoring a single event for, you know, 750 uh, to sponsoring a whole season for 10 grand. And there are various benefits that come from sponsorship. Number one, being able to choose what kind of food we get to have. And let's face it, 
in these uh, trying times. It's good to know you have that kind of control. Um, one other thing, we have a poll on the bottom. If you click on the, where do we click? Uh, click on the more button, you will see an event notification question. How did you find out about the event? Please uh, click on that. Uh, tell us how you heard about it. Uh, we're trying to understand what uh, way we can best promote uh, Lunchalytics going forward. So on that note, I hand it over to Mr. Parkati, who will regale us with tales of goaltending and machine learning. Take it away, Mike. Thanks, Dan. <laughs> uh, okay, so hopefully everybody sees my screen. I've got a PowerPoint deck today, and then I'll be maybe doing a quick demo at the end, but we're going to be diving into goalies today. I'll be sharing some research. I actually published a little bit on this a couple of months ago, my blog. I'm still doing the odd blog post at uh, boysonthebus.com um, about this. And so that it's what I'm kind of fascinated with is uh, how early you can get signal on goalies and this concept of uh, how you even know a goalie is good. Um, so I'm, I'm just a little bit about myself. I'm VP of Data Analytics at Connexus Credit Union. That They're based in Regina. I'm based in Edmonton. I've uh, been a hockey analytics guy for a long time. Did, did dabbled uh, <laughs> with uh, some NHL stuff. Worked with Dan, uh, with the others a little bit. And yeah, just, I don't know, been around a while. <laughs> okay, uh, problem statement. Given a known career to date, how do I know if a goalie is good or bad? That's the basic setup. That's our basic problem statement here. Let's see if we can start attacking this thing. So what makes a goalie good? So good is like a you know, subjective thing. Uh, might uh, change if you asked different people or ask them at different times, right? So can you say a goalie's good after a good game? Well, that's a bit noisy probably, right? What about a good 40 game run? Guys like, you know, Matthew Garon or something like that, you know, they, they, I thought he was good. <laughs> you know, at some point you think, yeah, he's pretty good. Uh, but then maybe not so much. Uh, what about a non-catastrophic season as a starter? You know, that's not bad. What about three to five consecutive good seasons as a starter? You guys can probably think of examples where that was true. And then, and then the wheels fell off. What about being a Vesna finalist? Somebody like Cam Talbot. He was pretty good. Uh, what about winning one? Like Jim Carrey over here. He, he won one. In 1990, he beat Dominic Hasek. Hasek had like 15 points better save percentage that year, but you know, Jim Carrey, you know, played 71 games, it was pretty good. What about starting on, a, on an Olympic team? That's a pretty good marker. Carey Price, he's pretty good. Um, maybe not this season, or the last two. What about being in the Hall of Fame? Uh, Mar Martin Brodeur, winning his goalie of all time, I, I wouldn't look at his last four seasons, when it wasn't very good. Um, so what makes a goalie good? When can you say these things? This is a, you know, a black art. So let's talk about Ben Scrivens. I'm just going to try to illustrate this problem a little bit. Okay, so uh, this is uh, ben, ben Scrivens' career, you know, uh, career game number on the x-axis, the y-axis is his career save percentage up to that point. So on game 15, Ben Scrivens uh, had an 899 save percentage, right? So if you were to ask this question about him then, you'd be like, no, I don't think so. But then he goes on a bit of a run. On by game 32, he's got a 9-10, and at this point, he was traded to the the Kings. Um, so you might say, I don't know, 9-10's okay. It's not fantastic. So put yourself in the shoes of a GM making these decisions, right? Um, you have to ask this question and answer it. If you don't think he's good, you move on. Uh, game 51. This is his career with the Kings. By the end of that 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 little stint with the Kings, he had a 9-17. So that's it's pretty good. You know, it's not all-star level, I suppose. Pretty good. He was traded to Edmonton. Um, game 64, he has a 921. If you remember that early, early career with the Oilers, man, that was pretty good. Uh, a lot of people were, you know, we were using Scrivesina. That was all good stuff. He was lots of fun. 921, very good. And I, I think we all thought he might be a starting goalie at that little point in time. Um... By game 93, he had a 9-11. Uh, you know, the wheel started to come off a little bit. You're like, I don't know anymore. Maybe this is just a little bit of a pocket of badness. And then by game 129, he's down to 905. And he's traded to Montreal. Uh, 905 is pretty bad uh, for somebody that, at this point in their career. Maybe he's going to turn around with Montreal and then no. By game 144, he had a 144 game career. By the end, it was a 905. And so that is the NHL for you. He is in and he is out. 
144, he is out. And so we don't really get any more data on Ben Scrivens. So, you know, what would you say about Ben Scrivens? Do you think he's good? Did he have a good career? Was he a good goalie? I don't know. So let's, uh, let's think about like a general mental model about how to conceive of goalies. So I, I imagine, you know, this middle mass, this gray area of potential unproven goalies, either ones playing in the league or not quite in the league. Maybe they're in junior, maybe they're in different leagues across the world. They're in this big mess of goalies where I don't know. They're just new ones show up from the ether, you know. Um, a small subset are going to pass somebody's semi-arbitrary line for, for, for goodness, right? Just imagine a few just trickling up to the top here. Yeah, they're good. And then a small subset go down and they're called bad, bad NHL goalies. So this might differ between teams or GM's minds and the, the arbitrary lines for goodness and badness are different for everybody. So kind of my goal here is try to set some reasonable line for good and bad. That's the overall idea. Let's think about like the inefficiency of goaltending for a second. This isn't what my presentation's about, but this is just a, a general reflection on, on uh, paying for performance. So on the x-axis, we've got the 2019-20 cap hit in millions of dollars. The y-axis, we've got the average save percentage over the last three seasons for a bunch of goalies. So very widespread, very like there's a correlation here, but it's not a super tight one. Uh, you've got goalies that go way off into the bad side, you know, Carey Price or Bobrovsky or late career Lundquist. These, you know, <laughs> very good goalies, very good goalies at, at certain points in their career, but now not really giving you a bang for the buck. You're paying for things that happened a long time ago, right? That's not probably news to people. Uh, but then as you go up here, up and up into the left, you get good value. You got people who aren't making very much that are giving you pretty decent performance. So the general, you know, reflection here is, you know, you could pay 10 million bucks for Carey Price, or you could be paying you know, half a million or whatever, or a million and a, and a bit for Linus Olmark or something, you know, or <laughs> instead of uh, Braden Holtby, you could have Mike Smith, uh, about the same amount of save percentage. Um, but, uh, you know, Smith is about um, a third of the cost of Braden Holtby, right? So anyways, there's a lot of inefficiency going on here. And it gets more inefficient as people get older, you know, the, the, the orange dots for, for goalies who are 29 and older seem to have a much wider spread. Um, so what's a decent strategy if you were to look at this chart? Well, the obvious one would be to target the top left. That's a pretty simplistic way to think about it. And honestly, if it's heuristic, that's probably not too bad. Um, there's guys in this area here that, you know, I've liked for a long time. And I this guy has liked for a long time. Halak, Yaroslav Halak is probably the, the most underrated goalie of his generation. I don't know if he ever became a true, true starter. He was a shared starter at some points. But, uh, you know, there's some un untapped value here in this, in this square. And value that people know about. I mean, you got Vasilevsky and and Bishop, who are you know everyone knows they're they're good. Um, so that probably wouldn't surprise people. But you know, what are the problems here? You know, established goalies in the top left know they're in the top left, and so they know they're likely due for a raise. You know, Darcy Kemper, he's uh, just got a new extension, right? So he's instead of uh, being a a bargain, he's going to go up to four and a half million bucks, right? So they they know this. You know, they're, they're they know they're underpaid. Um, so teams who have an amazing deal on a top goalie know they have a good deal. So you're not going to get them. So from a procurement perspective, it becomes a challenge. You're not going to give up uh, Ben Bishop for nothing. You've already got him. What's the point? Uh, goalies in the top left signed to long-term deals at mid-career tend to fall, right? So we got all these guys over here on the bottom right that they were over here at one point. They, they had their time. They proved themselves. And then they, uh, you know, they get older and things fall off and whatever. Uh, the other issue here with this chart is that save percentage can be a somewhat distorted picture of value, um, which, you know, should probably be obvious. But so let's talk about like goalie hacking. So what's a good hack? Um, so goalies that are very good, I mean, they're going to get paid eventually. So we need to exploit that period before they get paid as much as possible. That's the key. You, you know, if you sign him to a long-term deal, even if, you, even if he's covering the $10 million bet, you're still paying the guy $10 million bucks. So you got to find those goalies before they make $10 million, you know? So the hack is let's try to identify good goalies as early in their careers as possible. I want to know who they are. Is my goalie good as early as possible? And I want to find other goalies on other teams that are good before that other team might know it. It's you creating, creating information asymmetries and exploiting it. That's all good. The corollary here is identifying bad goalies as early as possible and avoiding them. Or if they're on your team to get rid of them. That's pretty easy. I, I like this idea of using analytics to inform decision-making, right? 
Okay, so a quick refresher on probability functions. We're gonna be talking about probability functions for a little bit here. So there's two, two basic types of, of distributions. You've got continuous distributions, which are nice and smooth, things like height. You can, you can define height to like 100 decimal points if you wanted to. So all these, you know, so you got this nice smooth curve, but then there's discrete functions. They, they talk about things that either happened or didn't. So a goal is a good example of something that's discrete. You can add up goals. Uh, you can't have a partial goal. Uh, you have to have a whole goal. Um, so the probability of something happening in the discrete sense, it's reflected in this probability mass function. So, you know, you've got uh, zero goals here, let's say, and that had a 2% chance of happening. That's what this kind of says over here. If you add up all of these bars on the probability mass function, you get a cumulative just distribution function, a CDF, right? So you're gonna, you got this increasing sense and you know, one pertains to 100% of possibilities happening. So you got all these things adding up to one. Um, so I'll be using that parlance throughout this presentation. Probability mass function, cumulative distribution function, CDF. Okay, so let's talk about an in initial idea for how we might do this. For any goalie at any point, I wanna figure out how likely a good goalie would have been to produce the same results or better. It's a general statement, so let's analyze this. One way to do it might be to use the binomial distribution. Uh, so I, I actually did that last summer. I did a series of posts using the binomial distribution to, you know, a, a simple sense of like saves and shots and goals and consider them trials. Consider each shot as a Bernoulli trial. And when you add up a bunch of Bernoulli trials, it equals the binomial distribution. So this is just like a toy example of a, you know, a 9-10 goalie. What's the probability of a 9-10 goalie making X amount of saves in a 25-shot game? This is an analytical approach. Like this, this, you can enter stuff into this formula up here in the top right and get these numbers. So this is all known stuff. That's why yeah, I like this approach. These are known distributions, known properties, um, with known conclusions. Um, the issue here is that in hockey, Every shot is different. And that's one of the limitations I talked about last summer when I was going through this analysis. Every shot is different. Um, so there's a, a bunch of context that gets lost when you just use raw shots and raw save percentage. Um, and you also have to de define some desired theta parameter in this formula up here, which basically says like, what's your assumed level that you're shooting for? I, I used a theta that I just, it was semi-arbitrary. I looked at starting goaltender's save percentage and said, I wanna have that. Um, so I thought something could be a little bit better than this. So anyways, so I'm going to introduce this stat. It's a really hilarious acronym. Probability of expected goalie replication. PEGGER. Really awful acronym, actually. But anyways, um, I, I, I'm finishing a master's uh, degree at Georgia Tech, and so I had a project team that I kind of worked on this with. I kind of expounded on some of the things that I worked on last summer with them, and they helped me with kind of data engineering and data viz and all kinds of fun stuff. So I just wanted to put their names here. So let's establish a base unit for analysis here. So we're gonna use expected goals. Um, so this graphic here, this, this was the original image that I posted on my blog in 2013 when I first started talking about expected goals. Um, and just the general idea is, you know, different shots have different probabilities of going in the net. And so at the time I expressed as a function of two things, the shot type and the distance from the net and feet. And I'm gonna still guess those two things alone are gonna get you pretty close to the mark for a pretty accurate sense of probability of going in. Um, so there's much more uh, rigorous and robust methods now using machine learning to try to get at this concept. But it's at the end of the day, that's what we're getting at. So this gives us a baseline to establish good and bad performance um, because it's gonna give us a sense of is the goalies giving up more or less than, than uh, you would have expected, this concept of like the expected goalie. Um, so step one in my process or our process was to create a new expected goal estimate. Um, this wasn't the, the feature of what we were trying to do. I just kind of wanted to make sure that we had something, we had an expected goal estimate that was like good, was comparable against the best in class. So the benchmark that we used for our analysis was the evolving wild figures. Um, grabbed all the shot event records. It was like 1.25 million records. We grabbed a bunch of different features, mostly from Money Puck. They have a fantastic data download area, but then some from Hockey Reference. We actually used some box stats in there to see if we can juice some explanatory power. Uh, I, I programmed Python, Anaconda Stack, Jupyter Notebooks, all this fun stuff. And here's a bunch of different features. None of this stuff would probably surprise people. The things that seem to be imp important in describing how a goal becomes a goal distances and was it a rebound and the type a little bit and the angle pretty pretty obvious stuff so anyways we weren't we got close to the evolving wild uh benchmarks uh for log loss this is what this is here um 
I think they trained theirs for like three days or something. We trained ours for eight hours. So that's probably why we didn't do as, as exhaustive of a grid search, but uh, we're pretty close to the state of the art here. So anyways, so we've got some expected goal estimates. That's all good. Let's do a quick refresher. So how you use a CDF to simulate stuff. So remember that CDF we talked about on that other, on that other graph. Here it is, okay. So the idea with simulation is that you can take any random uniform uh, uniform is uh, between zero and one. So any, any number between zero and one. And you can use it to simulate a number from literally any kind of distribution if you know that distribution's CDF. Uh, that's all you need, random uniform, boom. So here's two examples of a random uniform number, 0.87 and 0.117. Um, so given this totally random unspecified CDF I just grabbed, if I generated these two random numbers, you just, it's called the in inverse transform method. You, you look it up on the y-axis, you go over to see where it hits the CDF, and you say, okay, I got a 0.87, I'm gonna give you a six from this distribution. I got a 0.117, I'm gonna get a two, right? So that's, you can do this with any CDF. So the idea with using simulation and expected goals is very similar, grab the CDF. So right here, we're gonna use the CDF for a shot with 0.12 expected goals. That's a 12% probability going in the net. Right, so if I got those two same random uniforms or pseudo random, I should say, uh, if I got this number, I can tell you in a simulated sense what it would have been. Right, so this 0.87 would have been a save, or the 0.117 would have been a goal because it's underneath 0.12. It's that simple. So you can generate thousands of these, um, very very simply. Uh, so, you know, this is just to give you a sense of like the spread. If you've got a 0.12 expected goal shot and you simulated it a bunch of times, what would happen? So sometimes in the simulation, uh, it ends up being goals quite a bit and sometimes it gets saved quite a bit. So you got a bunch of saved over here. So um, we are gonna blow this concept up writ large. So um, just imagine simulating this for one goalie in his first career game. So he's got his first game ever, this is all you know about him. He's facing 32 shots on this game, in this game. You know what the expected goals were for those shots right here in this burnt orange color here. And then you know the actual goals, you know what happened, right? So in the middle here, I'm gonna do a bunch of simulation. So for each shot, we're gonna generate 10,000 random uniform numbers between zero and one. And if any of those numbers are under this expected goal number, we're gonna call that a simulated goal. Boom, one. Zero, zero, one. Uh, so we've got 10,000 simulations. So the first simulation is the sim goal one. So at the bottom of this one, there was zero goals. Sim, the second simulation, there was four goals, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You do 10,000 of these. The 10,000th had two goals. So at the end of the day, you can look at the expected goals versus the actual goals and say, okay, I would have expected 2.28 goals, but the goalie only let in two. That's pretty impressive. He was under what I would have expected. That's good. The question is, how impressive, how impressive is this? Um, so let's find out. So we're gonna plot it into a PMF and a CDF. Okay, so that, that toy example I just did, the 32 shots, these, this is the output of a 10,000 run simulation. So out of 10,000 times, that goalie, the expected goalie would have let in zero goals like 8% of the time. He would have let in one goal about 22% of the time, et cetera. Then here's the CDF, you add them all up, right? So what actually happened? What actually happened was the goalie let in two. You look this up on your axis and say, 60% of the time, the expected goalie would have done as good or better, okay? So isn't that, that interesting, right? His, his actual goals is lower than, than the expected goals, yet the expected goalie would have done better or the same 60% of the time, kind of counterintuitive, but that's the kind of the intuition behind what we're doing here. Okay, so what makes this uh, Pegger score so useful? The probability of expected goalie replication. So for our goalie for this one game, it was 60%. Expected goalie would have done as good or better 60% of the time. Why do I like this? Well, it makes different sample sizes comparable to each other. You know, how impressive is this? And I think that's one shortcoming of something like, you know, you'll see expected goals above or below average. Well, the time scale is a bit off there. I like how this normalizes it to like you know, compare people with 100 shots or 1,000 shots. Save percentages like this. I like that. 
uh, it neutralizes the varying shot qualities that you're going to see, your t team quality, your PP time, or whatever. You can have an expected goal across all game states, PP, PK, whatever. So uh, you, all that context that ha the save percentage falls down in for this, like it, it allows normalization for some of that stuff. And then it lends itself incredibly easy, easily to hypothesis testing. And so I'm going to get into that right now. What do I mean by hypothesis testing? So step four here is we're going to apply a simple statistical test. So here's our same CDF that we saw in the last thing. The, the, uh, the pegger score here is still 60%. We're going to set up rejection zones. So the, not, the null hypothesis here is that this is an expected goalie. Start there. That's your null hypothesis. The, hi, the alternate hypothesis, hypotheses would be that he is better than the expected goalie or that he is worse than the expected goalie. So test one is going to be about being worse than the expected goalie. If the expected goalie would have done that 95% of the time or more, you can make some, that's, in, that's frequent enough that this, he's probably worse than the expected goalie, this composite idea of what an expected goalie is. If this score was below 0.05 or 5%, it's infrequent enough that we're gonna reject the hypothesis on the good side. I think it's infrequent enough that this is a good goalie. You know, it's very infrequent for an expected goalie to do this, right? So for our, our little toy example here, this goalie's neither good nor bad. He's, he's somewhere in the middle here. He's between these two rejection zones. So step five is, let's take that, that, that PEGR score and calculate it after every game of somebody's career and plot it over time and see if it ever, ever reaches a rejection zone, ever. Um, so we've got the rejection zones at the top and the bottom, bad, good at the bottom there. Um, so here's Ben Scrivens again. So we're going to re revisit Ben Scrivens' career. So at certain times, he kind of gets close to the good rejection zone to say like he's a good goalie even at his peak where everybody was like let's sign Ben Scrivens for half a decade he's awesome uh, he still never got to that rejection zone to say that he's a good goalie right he didn't have enough evidence and at the end run where he's you know getting kicked out of the league for being bad still didn't have enough evidence to say either way so he's in this gray cloud he never left this state that, that gray middle state of the assumption of being just an expected goalie. This is something that you know, happens for expected goalies um, a reasonable amount of the time, right? So let's talk about the, the outputs of this model. So all this modeling was done on data up to the beginning of the current season, whatever we call this current season. So it doesn't take this season into account at all. So, uh, but it's got every goalie from 2007 to 2008. Any goalie who started their career after that season is gonna be included in this. So if you think about applying that model after every game of a goalie's career and looking for any time it was ever able to make a call on any goalie, we're gonna brand that goalie, good or bad. If he ever got to the bad rejection zone, we're gonna call him bad. If he ever got to the good rejection zone, we're gonna call him good. So if you just, this, the graph's about just waiting a little bit. Let's not do it on game one, but wait to brand people until game six and later. So if you waited until game six, you're able to call 30 goalies good, 30 goalies bad, and you're inconclusive on 55. Ben Scrivens is part of this 55. He's neither. We didn't have enough evidence either way. The good thing about this model is that zero are called both at any point in their career. Um, um, so that's good. Uh, that, that should be what it is. But what about the sustainability of this, right? So this, this is about it giving a general sense of, for goalies that I call good here, there's 30 goalies that we call good. What percent of their career is spent below 0.5 on that graph? You know, the good half. How much of their career do they spend on the good half of the graph, right? Huge, well, not huge, but a decent sized majority. You know, you've got uh, 18 or 19 out of the 30 goalies spend 90% of their careers or better on the good half of the CDF. That's pretty good. Um, nobody actually spends most of their career on the bad half of the CDF out of anybody that we call good. The, the people that come closest are uh, Hutchinson and Mrazek. Uh, they've, got, they've got branded good at some point, but they, they ended up spending, you know, 50 to 60% of their careers on the good side so far, well, up to the beginning of last year, anyways. And then the, you can do the same thing for the bad goalies. The 30 guys that we called bad, uh, 21 or 22 of them spend uh, over 90% of the career on the bad half of the CDF, uh, which is, you know, where you would want them to be. If you're going to call them bad, they should spend most of their careers on the bad side. The, the goalies that it got kind of like most wrong, Devin Dubnik and Corpus Allo. 
so Dubnik's fascinating. So he started his goal, his career with like, you know, pretty awful Oilers teams, uh, got, got blitzed, got called bad early. Then got, he got way better, you know? So he ended up spending only a third of his career on the bad half of the CDF, even though at some point he got called bad. So that's kind of fascinating that he's the one that kind of broke it. But, um, Here's a here's a like a general representation of all goalies, all the 115 goalies in our sample size here. Red for goalies that ever got rejected is bad. Green for all the goalies um, accepted is good. And then the blue guys who are inconclusive, uh, they're, they're going to get drowned out because um, you play long enough, you're going to have usually you get some call made on you. But um, so this action is what we would have expected, right? You've got lots of green on the bottom half of the CDF. Um, for their careers here, and then a lot of red on the top half of this CDF, so great. Um, it's kind of sorting them into the proper piles, and it seems to do it with pretty decent efficiency, you know, like by game 50, even game 40, there's only a couple guys who are who you're eventually gonna call bad that are still on the, you know, the good half of the CDF, let's say. So that's pretty good. Um, so um, I'm getting kind of near the end here, but this is the list of all the 30 good calls and all the 30 bad calls. So I've got, you know, them descending ordered by their career length. And then the first game you were, that they were able to be called good or the first game they were able to be called bad. And then that sense of like, did they, what percentage of their career did they spend on the good half of the CDF, you know? Um, so, you know, Jonathan Quick has, you know, up to the beginning of last season, he had a 687, uh, a game career and you're able to call them good on 232. So pretty far into it. Uh, Carey Price you needed 440, 455 games to be called good. But most of the time, you know, you've got these guys that you're able to call good very early. Game 22, 10, lots of guys who you called on game six. Um, where it's like, if you showed me Connor Hellebuck's uh, game six, you would have said, I think he's promising. He's called good on game six. You know, that's pretty good. Um, but then there's, you know, guys at the bottom that, you know, either were probably bad calls by this, or maybe we just didn't get enough data. I think goalie is the ultimate opportunity bias position. There's goalies out there that never got a chance, you know, that we never, we never got to see whether, whether they were good or bad, you know? Um, so this, I don't even know who this Charlie Lingren guy is, but guys who are young and up and coming, Mackenzie Blackwood's looking pretty good, uh, even to the beginning of last season. Um, and then UC Soros is another guy. He's pretty good. But it, it, like Calvin Picard, you know, the, he didn't, you know, he, he was, he started his career on fire and then kind of went through four or five teams. I think the NHL gave him a pretty good shot and he didn't really pan out, but man, he started hot more than the expected goalie would. That's kind of what this is saying. Right. Um, and then Grubauer, none of these guys are probably surprising in terms of like good goalies, at least at some point and then bad goalies. So the interesting ones here, you know, Dubnik, He's very up and down career, probably the most up and down career of any goalie. Um, and then Darcy Kemper's on here too. He had a pretty uh, inauspicious beginning to his like five years of kind of just average or below average. It's he's 30 now, or I'm just about to turn 30, you know? So he kind of turned this around at some point. Jacob Markstrom's another one where it rejected him pretty early and he's taken a long time to turn around. He's had a pretty un under underwhelming career up to this point. Right. But then this year he starts it on fire. So great. Um, but man, you had to slog through a bunch of <laughs> bunch of bad stuff to get there. Um, and all these other ones are probably uh, wouldn't be all that surprising to most people. Um, so the final visualization is uh, it's available on this. It's a Tableau link. Brian Haley, one of the guys I was working with, uh, set this up. He took the outputs of the model and and uh, visualized it. So I'm going to just show you quickly what that looks like. This is the final thing. So let's uh, we'll reload here. And I guess I'll, I'll show you, let's do a, an Euler, um, since there's probably lots of Oilers fans on the call. Okay, there we go. Okay, let's do Miko Koskinen. Sorry, my dog's in the background. So rem reminder, this is just up to the beginning of the current season, so the, the current season's not gonna be in here. Um, whoop. I'm sure a lot of people are <laughs> maybe hitting this thing at the same time. <laughs> but anyways, the idea is if this never actually loads, you can visualize that, um, that Pegger score across his career. And then when you hover over, you can see the actual, the probability mass function at any game. After any game, you can see how likely his performance was. Um, yeah, sorry, it's not loading here, guys. 
So anyways, I can probably take that. That's the end of it. Uh, I can probably take questions if there's uh, if there's any questions at this point, because we're over time. So the first question is, have you ever isolated this approach only to playoff data or would that kill the sample size? This was only with regular season data. And, you know, it's a funny, funny question because you like the sample that uh, playoff games give you, but then is it a, is it a bit of a different fish? Um, I think it's, I think it's a really cool way to potentially think about analyzing it and uh, get expected goals for, for playoff. You know, I, I generally, I think there's a different kind of, it's apples to oranges to some degree, but maybe not, right? So it's a good, good question. Any other questions about the goalie? So who should the Oilers uh, go after for their next goalie? Uh, like, it kind of depends. Like Miko Koskinen, I think he's, uh, he, he never gets rejected as bad or, you know, and he's never accepted as good in this model, right? Uh, he's kind of somewhere in the middle. And I think that's kind of where he's at. He's probably, I would bet he's overpaid by about, you know, half a million bucks to a million bucks, something like that. Um, and you're, you know, it's going to be hard to kind of move that over the next few years. So I, I, I think finding a, a, a good value goalie to complement him is a pretty good one. So you can go two routes. You can either try to grab a veteran who is now underpriced. So based on, you know, some of that early analysis, guys like Ryan Miller or, or Halak are pretty decent shots uh, or Kadobin, guys like that. Um, the very good performance for a long amount of time. Uh, I would, I would consider those. Um, but then there's also the younger guys. And so, you know, guys like UC Soros or, um, you know, I'm sure if I ran the numbers this year, there'd be goalies that just played a few games this year that are, be, you know, become of interest. Um, it's obviously tougher to get your hands on RFAs because you have to trade for them or whatever, procure them somehow. Um, but it's still possible. Um, so you know, Carter Hart's another one that I, I think is probably, he would show up pretty well in this model, right? But, the, you know, by the time they're acclaimed as good, it's probably too late. Yeah, you got to get them as early as you can, right? All right, we have a question. Is the Pegger score cumulative or just game to game? Cumulative. What we're looking at here. Yeah, so, so every, every, everything's cumulative. And a fascinating extension of this would be, you know, if I showed you, uh, if, you know, if you play around with it, if it actually loads eventually, but uh, Martin Brodeur has a portion of his career here, you know, so you can go look at how he did it and, you know, Hall of Fame goalies. And at the end of their career, if you just looked at the games post 2007, uh, they would have been, you know, rejected as a bad goalie, right? So this aging question and uh, the idea of maybe instead of taking the pure cumulative of every single game for the whole career, maybe at some point you start a rolling window. So maybe once he gets to game, 100 or 150 you just start creating a rolling window and then applying the rejection that that hypothesis test on that window instead i think that's probably an, a more interesting way to, to, to start thinking about it um, this was really intended for that early career stuff to identify as fast as you can so that you avoid concepts of name recognition and all that it's purely that hack of finding the guys who are not celebrities yet yeah okay you mentioned the model is confused by Dubnik since he started on a bad Oilers team, but wouldn't the expected goals percentage account for the team? <laughs> yes. The goalie would allow lots of goals? It would, to some degree, yes. Um, I don't know if you watched 2009-10 Oilers or 10-11 Oilers. Uh, certain teams, I think when you get to the extremes of any distribution, uh, it's going to start breaking things. Um, so that's why, even though it, it, the expected goals takes a lot of that into account, it's not perfect. Uh, there's there's certain contexts that expected goals can't take into account. It can't tell you that a shot was a one-timer, for instance, right? So even though I know it was a wrist shot from 15 feet out, it could have been a one-time shot. I have no idea. Um, so things like that just give me pause when I think about Dubnik's early career and and how he got blitzed early on and was able to turn it around. You know, so that that's you know you see some of those extremes with really bad teams. You know. Okay. Uh, is there a correlation to how long it takes to call good or bad with age so for example does a 20 year old carter hart have more likelihood to be called good or bad versus a 24 year old uh i haven't analyzed that one specifically and this goes back to the question of like would we expect goalies to get better over time and of course one of the famous hypotheses in early analytics was that you know goalies don't get better they are what they are to a certain point and they only atrophy when they re start reaching a certain age um you know, I tried to, to prove that at the time either, you know, I, I actually found myself on both sides of that argument in, in different, in, at different times. Um, so I don't think you would expect to see a, a ton of improvement over time. I think I'm, I'm more on the side that what you see as a goalie, you know, if he was to get in the net at 
21 versus 28, uh, it's still going to be pretty apples to apples about his talent level, I would say. But it's a good question. Yeah. In your opinion, is save percentage even worth looking at in a vacuum? Yes, absolutely. I do think so. Maybe I'm just old school at heart, but uh, I think there's lots of information encoded into a goalie save percentage. Um, it's, it tells you something. And just like any stat, you need to take these all into account at the same time. So uh, if no matter how awesome I think this, this thing is, I st would still look at things like save percentage and even string save percentage, situational save percentages, that kind of stuff for sure. Okay. Uh, I noticed uh, there's a goalie with, uh, that had hit the 0.99, yet still played a really long career in the league. Uh, how, had, how did that person have such a long career? Back oh, to it's, part. yeah, it's guys like, uh, you know, Brian Elliott's a famous example, or Andre Pavlik is a very famous example. Like, you could have known pretty early on those guys, and they just kept on hanging around, um, giving up more goals uh, than, you know, the expected goalie would have um, based kind of on reputation. These are the problems with the league sometimes. You know, they, you buy into a narrative and you keep giving a guy chances or whatever. Maybe he had a good playoff or something and he gets to play for the next, you know, seven years. Um, so yeah, that's part of the value of something like this is to give you a decision-making mechanism to ascertain that that badness has occurred and say, okay, let's just be objective here. Let's not sign Brian Elliott. <laughs> you know, he's been bad for a long time. Um, or, or, uh, I think maybe that curve was, uh, Steve Mason, that might've been that one where it's like, you know, he reached it at about game, let's say 60, you're able to reject him, and he played another, whatever, six years, um, of giving you subpar goaltending with bits where he's like, Oh, maybe he's back, but no, he's not. He's the body of evidence suggests otherwise. And you have to take that whole body into account. Okay. All right. We know you're a numbers guy, Mike, but Gut feel, what do you think? Is Koskinen going to end up being good or bad? Well, Koskinen is what? Is he 31? I think he's 31. So I think all you can reasonably expect from somebody like Koskinen is sideways performance. The question is how long uh, he can hold off until he really does atrophy. So if he's an expected goalie now, you know, um, how many more years can you get out of him? I think he's probably in that wheelhouse where the contract is probably going to run out and he's not going to be catastrophically bad. I think he's going to give you you know, just slightly below average to what a four and a half million dollar goalie should get you. So he's, I think he's fine as part of a platoon, honestly. Um, so if you can find either, you know, a good veteran who's got a good stretch of, of, um, of um, NHL career ahead of him, Mike Smith's probably a bit kind of older than I, I would have uh, tried to, to, to target. There's other goalies out there that you can find. Um, but, or, but also maybe look for a promising young goalie. Um, you know, using this analysis or, or um, if you were to try to replicate this in other leagues, let's say, or junior leagues or the AHL potentially to try to find a goalie who's got, you know, this, this, uh, this unfound gem. I love that idea of just while you've got some stability in somebody like Koskinen, who's like pretty average uh, to bring in somebody else to give them reps. So you can start learning that the, the sooner you can, you can learn about another goalie, move on to the next, the better, you know? All right. We'll do one last question. Uh, given all of this data you've collected, is there a range or timeline for goalie being good where you would consider a longer-term deal for them? Most long-term deals on goalies tend to turn up poorly for the team that signed them. So Yes, that's true. And that gets to one of those first graphs where the goalies that are all underperforming their value are all older, but they were all like Hall of Fame quality goalies, almost all of them, you know? Uh, and so that's, that is fascinating. So, you know, when I, when I start bucketing, you, there was a few things where I bucketed it, uh, you know, 28 and younger, 29 and older. That's generally the line. You know, if you're going to, if you're going to open the bank for somebody and give them a long-term deal, I wouldn't be thinking about doing that after the age of 28, you know, once they're in 29, 30, if you're signing them to like a six year deal, I think all bets are off. Maybe the first couple of years, <laughs> just like any player. You know, I think we're seeing that aging curve is getting pretty established across all position types, you know, so just be wary, right? So, yeah. All right. Well, thanks very much, Mike. That was uh, fantastic work. And I love that you've put it up in a tool online so others can play around with it. Uh, actually, sorry, I had one, one last, last question. Sure. Um, any uh, uh, NHL teams using this information as far as you know? I don't have a clue. Uh, it's been hit a few times and, you know, you get pinged a few times, but I have no idea if they're actually using stuff. But. All right. Uh, reminder to everyone, please click on the poll and respond to that.
Oh, and just on the way out, uh, keep in mind that we have uh, probably two more coming up for the season. Still looking for perhaps another speaker and certainly looking for sponsors. And thanks all for attending. All the best.